On behalf of the International March of the Living, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Contrast and Comparison, the Holocaust and the Simchat Torah War. My name is Monice Newman, and I serve as the National Consultant for the International March of the Living. As you are all too painfully aware, October 7th, 2023, holds the record for the most brutal, vicious, and barbaric attack on innocent Jews since the days of the Shoah. Parallels abound between these atrocities and have become part of the fabric of our universal conversation since the outbreak of this war. In light of this, and seeking to help provide a greater insight and understanding, the International March of the Living turned to a world-renowned Holocaust historian, lecturer, author, and educator, Dr. Michael Berenbaum, to help us collectively achieve this goal. Dr. Berenbaum is the director of the Ziggy Zering Institute, which is dedicated to exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust. He's a professor of Jewish studies at American Jewish University, a rabbi, a consultant in the conceptual development of museums, the author and editor of 20 books, scores of scholarly articles, and hundreds of journalistic pieces. His work in film has won both Emmy and Academy Awards. Dr. Berenbaum will be interviewed by Richard Heidemann, senior counsel for the Washington DC-based firm Heidemann, Noodleman, and Kalik PC where he serves as counsel to victims of terrorism, anti-Semitism, and human rights violations. Richard is the honorary president for B'nai B'rith International, immediate past president of American Zionist Movement, and was the founding chair of the Washington Lawyers Committee at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Since our inception in 1988, the International March of the Living has been devoted to preserving the Jewish past, honoring both the victim and the survivor of the darkest chapter in human history, and striving to protect a better future for the Jewish people and all of humankind. We remain steadfast in this devotion and look forward to marching en masse in May 2024 from Auschwitz I to Auschwitz II Birkenau, united and unified in our mission to remember and never forget. Thank you for joining us. It is now my pleasure to welcome Richard Heidemann and Dr. Michael Birnbaum. Thank you very much. And Michael, thank you for uh, agreeing today to participate in these most difficult times. I'd like to take you and all of those who are participating with us today back to uh, 1933, Michael, to uh, approaching the time of the um, adoption of the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, in keeping with our topic of today, um, to, contra to contrast and to compare, share with us your views, if you would. Let me begin with a story. Many years ago, I attended a meeting of Jewish leaders uh, after a group had just come back from Ethiopia. They had reported that Jews were dying, that there was starvation, malnutrition, persecution, and that their condition was dire and they needed rescue. And then they said one word, but there's not systematic killing, it's not the Holocaust. And all of a sudden, everybody breathed easily. Um, the situation today is not the Holocaust, but it is enormously serious and we should not breathe easily. Let's go back to what the Holocaust is, which will again tell you what the events today are as opposed to that. The Holocaust was a systematic state-sponsored murder of six million Jews by the Nazis and their allies and enablers and supporters over a period of 12 years. It began with persecution, discrimination, definition, expropriation. It then began with ghettoization. And beginning in 1941, there was systematic killing in two ways. First, they sent mobile killers to stationary victims. And that was what we call the Holocaust by bullets. And then they reversed the process. And they, sent mo they made the victims mobile. And they sent them to stationary killing centers 
which we call factories of death in assembly line process. To give you again, Mark Twain once said there are truth lies and statistics to put it to you in statistics. And I'm immediately aware of it because I was in Poland last week. Belgians, 500,000 Jews killed in 10 months in 1942. Treblinka, a staff of, by the way, a staff of 104 of whom only uh, 14 were Germans, 30, uh, 90 were Ukrainians. Treblinka operated for 14 months between 1942 and 43, 925,000 murdered, a staff of 120 of whom 30 are Germans, 90 Ukrainians. What we mean to say, is, and Germany itself had conquered and allied itself with 22 different countries. It was the ruler of Europe. It was the most powerful force in the world. That's not what's happening. What happened on Simchat Torah is a pogrom. The pogrom challenges the very assumption that Israel was, uh, that any state has, and that is a state is, must protect its citizens. And it moreover challenges the core of Zionism, which is that Jewish people will be safe in a Jewish homeland. That brings us to a situation in which we are involved in war, and the war has to be distinguished, and I think President Biden has done a, a, it has to be distinguished verbally between a war against Hamas and a war against the Palestinian people. And the reason it has to be distinguished verbally between that is because at the end of everything, we're going to have to live with the Palestinian people. But in the interim, we must defeat and get rid of the infrastructure of Hamas, the military infrastructure, the command infrastructure, and that's going to be important, yet very, very difficult. So let me repeat, this is not the Holocaust, but that does not mean that you can breathe easily. It does not mean we can uh, relax. And the reason it's not the Holocaust, again, one more important thing to say is we are different. We have powers that we never had at that point, and the world is different. And I think it's important to note that we are not alone at this moment. President of the United States has been good. The Congress of the United States, uh, the House of Representatives first act passed a unanimous uh, resolution. We will see what happens with the aid to Israel. There's been military cooperation. There has been uh, diplomatic cooperation. President of Germany has the Chancellor of Germany has visited uh, Israel. The President of France has visited Israel. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has uh, has uh, visited Israel. So in that sense, we are not alone, and we have powers that the Jewish people did not have in the period between 1933 and 1945. Michael, thank you. Um, you referred in part of your answer to state sponsorship. Let's go back and stay just for a moment to that period of 1933, 1945. Uh, we know Hitler came to power. His party came to power. They enacted laws called the Nuremberg Laws, the Nuremberg Race Laws. I'm going to jump way forward to just simply 2005. The Israeli government, headed then by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, decided, very controversially at the time, to withdraw all Israeli troops from Gaza and to force every Jewish person to leave their homes, leave their businesses, and move into what I will call uh, other parts of Israel, but to totally withdraw from Gaza. That was 2005. In 2007, um, Hamas seized all of Gaza, essentially threw out the Palestinian Authority, essentially defeated uh, Fatah, and took over completely, much as Hitler and his party had total control of Germany. Would you compare, if you would, and contrast for us those periods 
as it relates to government control of the people and the impact of government control on the Jewish communities. Richard, let me um, start a, a drop differently and we'll come back. The first thing we have to say is that Israel does not occupy Gaza. Israel, Agreed. Israel made a decision that it would leave Gaza and it hoped that Gaza would be the first of the independent territories that could create a model of dual existence between a Palestinian entity and the Jewish state. The gamble that Sharon took, controversial as it was, was a demographic gamble because there were approximately 2 million residents in Gaza. He felt that if he gave them the opportunity to create their own entity and live in harmony with the state of Israel in modus vivendi with the state of Israel, Israel would be better off. He did it not because he was gracious to the Palestinians. He did it because he was interested in Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel and also interested in Jewish safety in the land of Israel. So the first thing is that um, you can't compare the power of Hamas with the power of Nazi Germany. And you also have to um, come to the notion that at the end of it all, Hamas has to be removed from power. And by the way, um, remember back to the end of World War II, the end of World War II, the goal of the United States was total surrender. And total surrender meant that we understood that Germany had to lose its Nazi regime. There was a term called denazification. And we invested heavily in rebuilding Germany in the aftermath of the World War II and the genocide against the Jews, the Holocaust. We invested heavily because we wanted to recreate Germany along the different lines. That was the Marshall Plan for the rebuilding of Europe. This is radically different. Look, uh, let's, let me present the paradox for you. The paradox, uh, and I'm gonna say it twice because I want our audience to fully understand it. The paradox is the strength of Israel is its weakness and the weakness of Israel is its strength. Let me repeat that because it's a, again a paradox. The strength of Israel is its weakness and the weakness of Israel is its strength. Because Israel is the power is the powerful one in this equation, the world looks at Hamas as an underdog and somehow believes that justice is with the underdog. What is the weakness of Israel is its strength? Israel cares about every human life and especially about the hostages. And consequently, it's going very slowly and very hesitantly and behaving very modestly at this moment with all the bombings because of its concern for human life. What's intriguing about Hamas is that they understood when they attacked on Simchat Torah, when they attacked on October 7th, they understood what the Israeli response would be. And because they understood what the Israeli response would be, they had no concerns for their own people. The way in which they behave, they A, set uh, their military operations in mosques, in schools, in hospitals, they set it among the civilian population, not having regard for their civilian population and believing that Israel is going to, in one sense, be more restrained, even in this period of unrestraint, Israel is going to be more restrained in protecting its civilian population than they are themselves. And this goes back to something that Abba Ibn said many years ago, which has proven to be not only eloquent, but unfortunately accurate, which is the Palestinians have never lost an opportunity to lose an opportunity. They had a tremendous opportunity in 2005 and 2006 to create something else out of an independent Gaza. And they forsook that opportunity. They went for radical solution 
and now they've come up with a a a, a pogromist response to what's happening in what happened in Israel. And that's the reason why we're standing at the precipice of this type of war. Michael, thank you. Um, looking at that period for comparison purposes of pre-war, pre-Shoah, and the time period building up to October 7th to compare and to contrast, please talk about Kristallnacht. Look, Kristallnacht, uh, as I describe it, it, was the end of the beginning and the beginning of the end. Building up to Kristallnacht, you had, let me take you through very, very quickly. Hitler came to power. He said what he wanted to do in 1925, and nobody quite believed that he would do that. The Germans who brought him to power, remember, he came in as a coalition government. The conservatives who supported him believed that the majesty of office would force him to the center. They believed that he didn't quite mean what he said. And some Germans voted for him because he was an anti-Semite. Others voted for him despite the fact that he was an anti-Semite, never quite believing what he would implement and believing that they could control him and force him, as it were, to moderate. One of the things that Elie Wiesel once said, which is becoming frighteningly true again, is Jews would be wise to trust threats and not promises. Believe what people say, and Hamas itself is committed to the annihilation and the eradication of the Jewish state, and does not make a very fine distinction between Israel and Jews. They said what they want to do, if they have the power, they would do it. The dramatic difference is that they do not have the power to do it without confronting Israeli power. And hopefully Israeli power will be overwhelmingly powerful in response to it. What is Kristallnacht? Kristallnacht, why is it the beginning of the, uh, the end of the beginning? Prior to that, you had, uh, for example, the book burning on April 1st, the expulsion of Jews from the civil service on April 7th. Uh, you had the book burning on May 10th. You had the boycott on April 1st. You had the expulsion of Jews from the civil service. You had the beginning of the process of what they called expropriation, making it impossible for Jews to live as Jews in Germany, hopeful, hoping that they would self-deport, that they would leave and Chaim Weizmann once said that the world was divided into places where Jews could not live and places where Jews could not go. Kristallnacht was essentially the burning of synagogues, the destruction of Jewish businesses, the uh, mass arrest of 30,000 Jewish men and boys from 16 to 60 and they bring, bring them to concentration camps. And after that, it was clear to everybody that Jewish life in Germany was impossible. And the only place is where do you go and how do you get there? And the world was an uh, inhospitable place to, um, uh, to Jews seeking refuge, to Jews seeking to immigrate. What then happened is that Germany kept invading territories, getting more and more Jews, that radicalized their own desire for a solution to quotation marks, the Jewish problem. And consequently, by 1941, they began with murder. And murder took on two forms. One, they sent the, the killers to the victims. The other is they sent the victims to the killing machines. That is an evolution that takes a long time. We, and, and again, the reason I stress this is because the Holocaust was a distinct, what we call a unique event, a ground changing event. And though there are similarities and comparisons, every comparison is to compare and to contrast, to understand what it shares in common and where it distinguishes itself, where it's different. And we shouldn't believe that everything, that anything is its equivalence, even though this is murderous and rampage. This is much more a pogrom. 
and but the difference between this and a pogrom is a Jewish government should have been able to protect its citizens from such a pogrom, and Israel will have an accounting of that at the end of the war, whenever that is. And the other thing is that we made misjudgments as to the capacity of Hamas and also believe that high-tech wall and all of these sensors would protect Israel, and they did not. So there'll be a military accounting and an intelligence accounting. How did we not know? And how did we presume that the way in which we structured protection, that Israel structured protection for the Jews living on the edge of Gaza was going to work? And there were tremendously important misjudgments on that. But again, we have power that we never had. And we also have friends, at least for now. And Jews are much less alone than they were then. That does not mean the situation now is good. I think it's terrible, but it's not the Holocaust. Michael, Germany was a sovereign nation. It made its own decisions. It adopted through its legislature its own laws. Let's compare and contrast that to Hamas. I want people to understand more about who Hamas is. For example, Hamas, it's an acronym for the Islamic Resistance Movement. Let everybody please understand that Hamas, the Islamic resistance movement, has been classified for the longest period of time as a designated foreign terrorist organization by the United States government. The United States government has not been at war with Hamas as the United States was at war with Germany. But Hamas has operated utilizing its other foreign terror organizations in Gaza with whom it sits in committees in order to make policy, in order to cause the dissemination of hate, in order to teach hate in the schools, and in order to launch attacks. Let's talk about the attacks of Hamas. Before I turn it back to you, Michael, I just want to put it in quick context. Over the last, shall we say, 20, almost five years, since, since the Camp David meeting between President Clinton and uh, Prime Minister Barack and Yasser Arafat, Hamas launched, along with other terror organizations throughout the Palestinian Authority, throughout the West Bank, but also from Gaza, they launched, as we all know, the second intifada, and thousands of people were killed or injured. Most of those attacks were suicide bombings done by one person, two persons, three persons. If we go from the period of the second intifada over the last 20 years, we've seen lone wolf attacks. We've seen knife attacks. We've seen some shootings, most of them done by ba bands of one, two, three generally not more than six people. How, Michael, do you put that, that history in context of what we saw on October 7th, Shabbat, Simchat Torah? Let's step back and say, um, because you, you made a very important point, which we shouldn't ignore. The most important point is that, um, uh, and I'm going to suggest that we make a, one more distinction, Richard. Uh, it wasn't only Hamas and its associates that launched the Intifada. Uh, Arafat made a decision that he thought that violence could increase the nature of the offer of peace. I'm not saying that that was the judgment of President Bill Clinton, not even the judgment of, of, Prime, Minister, of, of, of Prime Minister Barack was the judgment of Bill Clinton that Arafat didn't have the courage to declare peace. And one of the arguments we should use, and it's very important, we could now be in the 23rd year of Palestinian state. 
had Arafat made a different decision. The second thing is that this was launched in a very important context. It was launched in the context of where it appeared as if Israel and Saudi Arabia were going to come to some sort of modus vivendi. And this is the radical wings trying to destroy any possibility of a peace process. And had normal had the Saudi Arabian agreement come through, it would have represented normalization with the Shia Muslim community, and a whole range of states would have fallen in line to recognize Israel. And this was designed to torpedo that peace process. And every time Israel comes close to peace, the radicals try to torpedo that peace. And they do it, and they do it under the gambit of resistance. They do, they do it under the banner of being a resistance group. And we also have to say something about how they slaughtered. Because I want to focus, I, I, I you know, I, I spend my part of my life studying killers. Uh, they killed with a smile on their face. They killed by saying, Allah Akbar, the Lord is great. And even Anderson Cooper was amazed that they not only photographed the killing, but one of the killers sent the photographs back to his parents, see what I have achieved. See what I have achieved. Meaning that not only was he a killer, but he was proud of killing and presumed that his parents would what? Would support him in the killing, in the killing process. Uh, we have to say that we underestimated the capacity of Hamas because this was a well rehearsed, well done, uh, and I don't, I, I, and I mean that with tears and sadness in my soul, well done assault by a group that should have never had this power and should have never had this opportunity. And consequently, it's one of the things that Israel will have to deal with in the end. How is it that it underestimated the capacity of Hamas? Now, let's talk about one distinct parallel with the Holocaust. You know, I wrote a piece the other day in which I said the enemy is different, but the venom is the same. The enemy is different, but the venom is the same. Imagine what it's like to kill with a smile on your face. Imagine what it's like, what you must, how much you must be enraged in hatred to behead an infant or a child and to have a smile on your face, to be proud of it, to broadcast it, and to presume that this is what? Your key to, to prominence and preeminence in that world and i think it's it's very it's very it's very important i wish in one sense that this was a government versus government battle remember when it's a government versus government battle and we were through that in the 67 war we were through that in the 73 war what you have is you have army facing off army and that becomes in one sense an easier battle to handle Israel has done that several times. This is a much more difficult battle because in part, Hamas will retreat and hide behind the civilian population. They will use them as a human shield in the process. And one will have to fight urban warfare, trying to protect the civilian population when the enemy uses that civilian population as a shield, as a uh, as a way of protecting themselves, and they'll be able to escape. In that sense, they'll be able to escape into the general population. This is going to be a much more problematic battle than the battle of army against army. And in the battle of against army against army, there ends up being a surrender, or a government that can create a peace. At this point. Hamas has to be eliminated as a viable factor of government in the same way at the end of it all, 
we had per, we had total surrender as the goal in our relationship with Germany and the goal of the war itself. Let's talk more about government involvement. Um, the United States government designated the Syrian Arab Republic as a state sponsor of terror in 1979. The government of the United States designated the Islamic Republic of Iran a state sponsor of terror in 1984. In, a, in many cases where our law firm representing victims of terror have brought litigation in U.S. federal courts under applicable U.S. law, judges have found that, among other things, Iran is a state sponsor of terror, Syria is a state sponsor of terror, and Hamas is a designated foreign terror organization, and therefore has granted to the victims judgments under U.S. law against the state sponsors of terror, because getting a judgment and enforcing it against uh, Hamas is nigh on impossible, although not totally impossible. But once one has a judgment against Syria, against Iran, one can go after their assets with a federal court judgment, like any other federal court judgment, although this is special because it's under special statutes. Compare that, however, because we know that Syria has been sponsoring Hamas. We know that Iran has been and is today sponsoring Hamas. And just today, the US government is talking more about that. But I'd like to add to the mix Qatar, because Qatar is not on the State Department list of state sponsors of terror. Qatar has uh, and claims immunity for acts of terror in the United States. And yet we know that Qatar funded untold millions to Hamas. Now Qatar is busy helping on the hostages. But before we get to the victims and the hostages, I'd like you to compare for us the difference between Germany as the perpetrator and Iran, Syria, and Qatar as the sponsors of the terror organizations, specifically Hamas here, but also Palestine and Islamic Jihad that have committed these horrendous barbaric acts. Let's look at the complexity of Qatar for a moment because it's an enormously sensitive issue. It's sensitive in three ways. The first way is Israel permitted the transfer of funds from Qatar to Hamas because it assumed that if, Hamas, if it improved the situation of the Gazan population, it also did a second thing, which is it permitted Gazans to people, residents of Gaza to work in Israel proper. Israel approved the transfer of funds and improved the working permits for the Gazan, for the population of Gaza to work in Israel because it was under the assumption that if it approved, improved the conditions of life in Gaza, Hamas would moderate. That was a mistake. And the other thing, the other part of it is that the workers it allowed into Israel who were earning money and bring that money back to the Gaza Strip ended up being instruments of the intelligence gathering because they are the people who plotted the different kibbutzim and moshavim and different towns in which the um, uh, Hamas perpetrated the massacre that it did. The United States government also does not begin in this with clean hands because it uses Qatar as the source of an American base, a large, significant American base that has extraterritorial status in Qatar the only comparable thing that I know, and I'm probably wrong on this historically, is the same way in which Guantanamo has extraterritorial um, uh, space in Cuba. It's, Amer it's regarded technically as American sovereignty. Cuban laws do not apply to it, obviously. So America has, and, and there's a debate within the Pentagon, which has fought a whole range of designations with regard to Qatar. And what you had yesterday, uh, or today, in fact, occur is that Secretary Blinken, who was in Qatar, 
came to an agreement with Qatar that Qatar would have to rethink its relationship with Hamas after this war. And Hamas and, and Qatar is trying to uh, adjust its circumstances by being the instrumentality of negotiating the release of the hostages. But the relationship between Qatar and the uh, Hamas and Qatar and Israel and Qatar and the United States will one, be one of the elements that undergoes reevaluation in the aftermath of this war. So that, that's Qatar. Let me just say what we have with Iran, which is very interesting. Um, there's an article in today's Israeli newspaper by Itamar Rabinovich. Itamar Rabinovich was the former uh, president of Tel Aviv University, the former uh, uh, um, um, uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States, and the greatest living expert on Syria in the Israeli um, uh, intellectual and political establishment. He said that we have to view this as the first war, the first of the Israeli-Iranian wars, because we're fighting with a series of Iranian proxies. Hamas is an Iranian proxy. Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy. Syria is an Iranian proxy. Uh, we can go around the map and look at the range of, uh, of Iranian proxies. And again, uh, is, uh, Iran is on the verge of being a nuclear power. And that makes it all the more, um, as it were, profoundly problematic. Uh, on the other hand, ironically, the closer Iran comes to nuclear power, the more certain Arab countries are willing to ally themselves with Israel against Iran, and consequently the possibility of normalization occurs in that context. And there have been um, uh, uh, a couple of different views as to how to deal with Iran. One of them was the treaty that, uh, that uh, limited for 10 years the, um, uh, the nuclear capacity of Iran, which uh, was negotiated by the Obama administration, which was, uh, the Trump administration decided against, and which led to the um, uh, dramatic scene of, of Benjamin Netanyahu addressing the Congress of the United States against the wishes of the President of the United States. Uh, uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago. Having said that, we have now seen that Iran, and we may have an advantage because it's very easy to send other people to die for you. And Iran has been reticent of putting its own people on the ground in the same way. But this is certainly a proxy war with Iran. And one again must assume that Iran's threats against Israel are real threats against Israel. Again, the capacity is different because as Iran moved toward nuclear capacity many years ago, Israel uh, purchased uh, two nuclear submarines from Germany with the idea that mutual assured destruction would prevent the Iranians from ever using that bomb against Israel. And consequently, it meant that we have the power, as it were, to defend. And the open question with Iran is, do the Ayatollahs believe so much in the world to come that they're willing to eradicate Iran in this world? Because they have to assume that if Iran uses a nuclear weapon against Israel, the result will be that a second strike capacity of Israel. I know we're going into doomsday scenarios, but we have to understand them. Let me- Well, you spoke, Michael, if I may, you spoke about proxies. And one I want to just add to the discussion briefly is Hezbollah sitting in Lebanon on the border with Syria, funded by Iran. They get their weapons. They're sitting with more than 100,000 missiles, much larger than the missiles that have 
remain in the stock of Hamas. Uh, they're threatening those. There are all kinds of problems. People have already lost their lives. Before we go to the many questions we've received in our last, uh, and that we'll cover in our last 15 minutes, I'd like to, if you would, concentrate a little more on this, um, uh, uh, this threat from the Ayatollahs to wipe Israel off the map, her use of proxies, her providing of all of the weaponry needed, and not caring about the victims. You talked about, we both talked about the barbaric nature of the attacks. We've seen that there were ISIS flags on some of the terrorists. We've seen that some of the terrorists actually carried instructions to behead, to rape, to maim, to murder, and to burn. What can you tell us about what we should fear before we get to hope? What should we fear further about Iran in this very next phase? I think the best way to say it is that you must believe that Iran's in, Iran believes in what it says and says what it believes. Again, let's go back to Wiesel. Trust the threats. In that sense, they're more reliable than the promises. And Iran has said what it would like to do and it has increased the capacity and the danger. Look, there are those in Israel who are arguing that essentially Israel should pivot now and use this opportunity to address Hezbollah. And there are those uh, who are trying to say, we don't want a uh, multi-front war. And if you look at Thomas Friedman's column in, in the New York Times today, He's talking about the six-day war versus the six-front war, because there could, are, is the capacity for multiple fronts here. And one of the things he did say, which we have to get to, Richard, is that one of the fronts is in the public of, public arena, in the um, in the social networks and in the um, all of the the um, attempt to portray Israel as Nazi-like and genocidal. And I think we have to get to that because this is where the people who are listening to us have an important role to play. This is where Jewish students and friends of Israel on campus have an important role to play. And this is where we're going to need to be informed and we're going to need to be active. Let's talk about action. Let's do it in the context of Hamas was having these great return marches. People all over the world, including in the United States, applauded them as civil demonstrations, when in fact, they were the parade ground for launchings of the kites that went over that very fence, of the balloons that went over the fence. And even now we saw that what over the fence on October 7th were paragliders in the same way from the practice sessions of the great return marches that recently came back together. Michael, the questions that we have have many common themes. One common theme is how do we persuade the March of the Living participants and all of those with us today of the relevancy of the statement never again when viewed in the context of our failure to stop Hamas from committing the atrocities of October 7th? Never again has to be, never again with my acquiescence, never again with my silence, never again without my distinct and complete opposition, and never again without consequences and without serious consequences. So I think one of the things we have to say is it's not sufficient to say never again, because we have to say, what does it require of us to do? The Israelis are putting their lives on the line. They are, standing, they are now both on the home front and on the uh, potential battle front, giving it their all. And we have to be engaged and involved and regard this 
as a moment that demands the best of us and our activism. We certainly can't consent to never again. We can't agree to never again. And we have to respond to that with activism. Let me say one more thing. I want Jews to have a thick skin right now. It's not going to be easy. And Jews have to have a thick skin. The first thing is they can't internalize the animus which we're facing. Secondly, they can't use it as a way of withdrawing from engagement with Jewish life. And they have to uh, see that they can take the pressure that's going to happen. Let me address one issue with the with the um, the opposition is saying that Israel is committing genocide. Uh, we have to address that very clearly. Number one, if Israel has the capacity to commit genocide, the provocation to commit genocide, and it's not committing genocide, it is engaged in military in a military battle. It is engaged in bombing, but bombing, uh, including bombing uh, areas in which civilians reside, have been part of war from the very beginning. One of the intriguing things that you see is that essentially more than 50% of the uh, Gazan population are children, so it's claimed. Now, a uh, country that was committing genocide would not face the fact that children were being born and children were being born in such significant numbers. One of the things that you look at in the history of genocide is it causes the victims of genocide to not have children and not feel safe about having children. Secondly, we have to understand that we cannot accept the numbers being used by Hamas as real numbers. We saw even uh, in, in the newspapers the other day, the director of the hospital whose parking lot was bombed said, well, it may have been 500, may have been 5,000, it may have been 50,000. Numbers don't, don't count and there is an exaggeration of numbers based on the idea that Israel should be portrayed as immoral and genocidal. And if Israel was genocidal and wanted to commit genocidal, it's done a lousy job of it. And the best evidence of that is the proliferation and the procreation of the Palestinian population, both in Gaza and in the territories of Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, where the population is increasing and the population is procreating. That's not a genocidal condition. Israel is engaged in in, in what is called um, uh, in, in warfare. It, it's engaged in, um, uh, in, in a situation in which it has to respond because the other population, the other party is not is using its civilian population as shields, and consequently, it's called asymmetrical warfare. And in asymmetrical warfare, one side is trying to protect the civilians, and the other side is trying to make the civilians vulnerable. And the people who are protecting the civilians, ironically, and you don't see this much in the press, people who are concerned about civilian life is not Hamas, but ironically is Israel. And that's precisely the expectation of Hamas that gives it its power because it's ready to accept martyrdom for its own population. Michael, when Raphael Lemkin coined the phrase genocide uh, post-World War II during the period of seeking justice, including through Nuremberg, which we've talked about in others, other programs, um, the term genocide has acquired a meaning more in common language over the last 75 years. What would you call the act of barbarism of Hamas on October 7th? I would call it barbarism. I would not call it genocide. And the reason is because I'm, I'm a historian and I go by the legal definition of genocide. 
and the legal definition of genocide, I can go into its technicalities. One of its technicalities is um, the destruction of people in whole or in part, but never defines what it means by in part. And consequently, if you kill one person or 20 people, or in this case, 1400 people, is that genocidal? The venom, the venom is what the venom is what we have to be careful about. And we have to make sure that they don't have the capacity to commit these acts of barbarism. And consequently, um, I, I do not believe that we should be using genocidal terms on either side of this equation. Now, when I say it's not genocide, that doesn't mean it's not serious. It doesn't mean it's not problematic. President Biden was 100% correct calling it evil, absolute evil. But it's not genocide, uh, uh, not because they wouldn't like to commit genocide, but because they do not yet have, do not yet, and hopefully never will, have the capacity to commit genocide. And because under new awareness, the government of Israel and its citizens will make sure that A, they do not have the capacity, and B, they do not have the opportunity. Warfare is not genocide. Warfare is warfare, but not genocide. Michael, you referenced the, the court of public opinion. Let's address that for a moment. The court of public opinion in the first days was supportive of Israel. Many governments, including the United States, still supportive of Israel. And, and Germany is supportive of Israel in the need to put a total end to the control and existence of Hamas. But in the court of public opinion, through perhaps intersectionality, people are not hearing so much about Hamas's atrocities. They're transitioning over to Israel's oppression of the Palestinians, and it's become a free Palestine campaign. What recommendations do you have to everyone here on today's program? Let, let's, go, let's go back to uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, Israel has to have, the, Israel and Jewish people have to have the capacity to tell their narrative. And to tell their narrative, it's important to go back to basics. Gaza is not occupied, it's independent territory. There are no Jews there. Settlements have been removed. The Palestinians have their own government. If a government attacks another population with rockets and invades, this is an invasion by the ruling powers of Gaza. We would not accept an invasion from Mexico or an invasion from Canada. No country would accept rockets being fired at their country without a response. This is asymmetrical warfare. This is a warfare in which one group is committed with all of its difficulties and all of its restraints. One party is committed to protecting the civilian population and doing minimal damage to that civilian population, though it understands it must do damage to that civilian population. And the other wants to use the civilian population as human shields. The group that wants to destroy and use its, its human population as its population as human shields is Hamas. And Israel has to remove the threat of Hamas, the challenge of Hamas, the, the, the terrorism of Hamas, not only from its borders, but from the entire area of Gaza. And that is a legitimate nature of self defense. President of the United States, the presidents and prime ministers of major European countries have said, and let's repeat it, Israel has the right to defend itself and it has the obligation to defend itself. That's the fundamental obligation of a country to its citizenship. And in terms of Jewish life, one of the greatest decisions the Jewish people, uh, you know, I'm gonna step back and say the following that I believe that one of the most important days, if not the most important day on the Jewish calendar is the 10th of Av. Not the 9th of Av, but the 10th of Av. And that's because in the aftermath of defeat, the Jewish people have always found a way 
to rebuild, regenerate, renew, and they've shown resilience. In the aftermath of the Shoah, the Jewish people decided that they would have to establish a state and, which had the capacity to defend its citizens and to protect Jewish life. Sadly, in this case, they fail, the Jewish state failed to protect Jewish life, and that must be held accountable in the aftermath. But the fundamental decision, fundamental future of the Jewish people, in part, and, a, and, and remember within a very brief period of time, the majority of the Jewish people will be living in Israel. Fundamental decision of Jewish people is that we have to be a free people in our own land with the capacity to defend ourselves. And if the Israeli government cannot achieve that, it will not be the government that rules. They will have another government come in in the aftermath of it all. So this goes back to basics, absolutely Michael. important basics. Michael, in our last three minutes, I'm going to combine two questions we received in advance, two parts. In the context of the tragedy and suffering by all the victims, their families, those, those killed, those injured, those taken hostage, many of whom we have no idea what their current status is. Two questions. One, from Ellie Rubenstein, the International March of the, of the Living Educational Director, many members of my community are feeling exceptionally anxious right now. Some cannot sleep at night. Others find themselves not able to breathe during the day at various times. Some break out in tears several times a day. Some can't watch the TV. Some can't get away from watching the TV. In short, people are fearful. What advice do you have for them? And the last question that I'll combine with it as we'll end is, how do we hold on to hope as a world Jewish community? Michael? There is reason to fear. There's reason to fear. But again, remember I said Jews need a thick skin. You have to be able to look fear straight. This is what we learned from survivors. You have to be able to look fear straight in the face and face it. And you can't cower before that. You can't back down before that. You can't lose your sense of pride and dignity before that. You must have that capacity. Let me give... Um, and, you know, it's it's very odd, uh, Richard, uh, one should not turn to a Holocaust scholar for hope. Um, but let me give you one glimpse of possibility. Uh, I was with a very important uh, professor of Middle Eastern studies yesterday, who said we are, we have just had an earthquake. After an earthquake, the ground is never the same. The world has changed. There's going to be before October 7 and after October 7. But remember something very unique, which is this is 50 years after the Yom Kippur War. And 50 years after the Yom Kippur War, you have to remember that four years after the Yom Kippur War, Anwar Sadat came to Jerusalem. We don't know what the response to the earthquake is going to be. The whole nature of Israel and Jewish life has changed in the aftermath of October 7th. That does not mean that it hasn't opened up possibilities. And let me suggest one final possibility. Why is Saudi Arabia seeking a relationship or not adverse to a relationship with Israel? There are two reasons. One is it wants to get something out of the United States, and it believes in, in a certain way that Jews can be influential in the United States, and we should remain influential in the United States. But the second reason is something we thought and we were mistaken about in the Yom Kippur War. I don't insult you by saying you and I are old enough to remember the fears of the Jewish community in the Yom Kippur War. 
we feared that power in the last half, in the last quarter of the 20th century would be in the control of natural resources. What we discovered in the last 50 years is that power is not in the control of natural resources. It's in the ability to deal with a knowledge-based economy, a knowledge-based world. And in the knowledge-based world, Jews have enormous influence and power. And Israel has shown itself to be monumentally successful in a knowledge-based world. Knowledge-based world has to harness the full powers of its citizenship, which is why in Saudi Arabia, we're beginning to have what? The use of women, because you can't have a knowledge-based economy. And Saudi Arabia was not making uh, gestures to Israel or open to gestures to Israel because it loved Jews, but because it thought of its own future in a knowledge-based world and sought that it had to, that, and, and that's true of the other Arab countries. And Israel ironically has at this point been blessed with one other element of natural resources. And that is because of desalinization, it is now able to solve what has been a millennial problem in the Middle East, which is the problem of water. So there are reasons to hope, but there, but in the immediate, period of time, for some period of time, the only way we can hope is that uh, is that uh, the Jewish state demonstrates its capacity to defeat Hamas and to withstand all of the attacks uh, from the Iranian proxies that are going to be involved. And we must keep American support for Israel strong and vital and vibrant. And that's all, that's all of our responsibility because uh, Israel should not have to stand alone and the United States should stand with it as it has. Michael, thank you for your brilliant analysis today. Special thanks to Monice Newman of the International March of the Living for conceiving of and bringing together this program uh, to Ariana Tipograph for her support behind the scenes. And I have one closing brief point. It's in the context of hope. While we all gather around and love the victims, while we pray for the memory of those whose lives were so tragically lost, taken senselessly and barbarically, while we pray for those who have been injured, and we wish them all a refua shalema. For those who have been resettled, we wish them all safe returns. We concentrate on the hostages because they are in the hands of murderous terrorists. But in the context of hope, let us remember that it was barely a few years ago that Israel was at war with almost every Arab League country except for Egypt, except for Jordan. And the Abraham Accords brought about a new day. A million Israelis have visited the United Arab Emirates and billions of dollars of trade have come about. You mentioned Michael, Saudi Arabia. Don't be surprised everyone to see Saudi Arabia and the United States and Israel stand together with other countries to enlarge peace with a commitment to a safe, secure, regional peace that includes, that includes the citizens of Gaza and that includes the citizens of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. We must have hope. It is our nature. And it was the very essence of Simchat Torah. So to all of you who joined us today, Michael, for your, again, brilliant analysis. Thank you all very much. And we wish everyone peace. We wish everyone hope. And let us stand together with pride as Jews who know what we've been through, know what we will endure, and let us stand tall. Because by doing so and doing so together, 
we will again see the sun rise over our country, the sovereign state of Israel, and God willing, the world. Thank you all.